Okay, everybody, let's uh, make a start. We've got a September's meeting of uh, the Moines of Adventure Astronomical Society. Can I uh, ask, are there any uh, new members who've joined in the last uh, couple of months? Well, we have a few in the audience, so uh, welcome, welcome to the Society. Um, I would point you to our new members officer, but she's not actually in the room at the moment. Um, that uh, that will be uh, Nerida, and uh, she, she may come in a little bit later and uh, welcome you. <coughs> she'll also, if you haven't already got a name tag, she'll produce a name tag uh, for you as well. Uh, just let her know um, uh, what, what names you wish to be uh, shown on, on your tags. Also, um, if you're not yet in the email group of uh, MPAS called eScorpius, um, please uh, get yourself on. Um, if you uh, don't know how to do that, uh, Come and see Nerida or come and see me uh, afterwards and uh, I'll get your email address and get you put into uh, that email group uh, because that way uh, it's usually both in the email group and the Facebook group of the society that you get to find out the more recent uh, things that are happening such as talks that are going on, uh, things that can't be planned uh, a month or two ahead, they just sort of come from left uh, field at us. Now tonight, uh, the image on the left-hand side there is uh, one that was put together by the Field Museum in uh, Chicago. And uh, that museum there is uh, actually the proud owner of uh, the majority of the Murchison meteorite that uh, fell. And we're coming up on the 28th of uh, September, which is not too far away now at all, uh, from being the 50th anniversary of the fall of the Murchison meteorite up in Murchison in central Victoria. <coughs> And this is showing a, a section out of the Murchison meteorite and uh, where it was believed to have formed in the solar nebula. So in other words, this is prior to the Earth uh, having formed. And so it's quite an unusual meteorite. Uh, if you've never seen a piece of the Murchison meteorite, I've got a little bit uh, here as well, which uh, I'm quite happy to show you um, a little bit later, I say, during the tea break. And you'll see it looks so quite, quite unusual. They stole it from us, and they could go and steal it back. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm sure they did it uh, all above board. <laughs> right, so uh, tonight, this, this hopefully will be uh, the, the order of events that we'll uh, do things. Uh, I'll uh, talk a little bit about what the Society's done in the last month since we last met, and what's uh, coming up. Uh, then I'll hand over to our visitor tonight, uh, Daniel Price, to uh, talk a little bit about uh, planet hunting. Then we'll break for a tea break. Uh, last month we uh, went a little bit long before the tea break, so this month we'll uh, we'll try and uh, stop somewhere around about nine, quarter past nine, to go for a bit of a break. Then after the tea break, uh, Sky is going to uh, tell us a few things about um, uh, the use of uh, big binoculars. And uh, Mark is uh, going to try uh, his hand at uh, Sky for the month for the first time, taking over from where uh, Greg was. So he's uh, encountered some uh, technical difficulties already so uh, I'm sure they'll all be smoothed out next time. Uh, then we were going to have Peter Lowe sort of talk about the outburst of uh, the black hole, Sagittarius uh, star, but since he's not here tonight we won't be doing that. So he, may, um, he may appear at uh, next month's meeting all being well. Then we've allowed some time for uh, Ian Sullivan to uh, tickle your brain with uh, some trivia and he's uh, got, uh, got five questions there to try and stretch the uh, grey matter. Uh, then I'll uh, uh, tell you a bit more about the Murchison meteorite. I've got um, three informational videos about it that uh, go for between about three and five minutes each uh, to show at the end. Uh, one was actually from uh, an ABC program in the 1970s, so it is in black and white, but it is actually very informative and it shows you uh, some of the people out searching for the uh, Murchison meteorite at the time. And then also a couple of more recent uh, ones um, by uh, various uh, people who've been uh, involved in studying the meteorite, including from the Field Museum and from uh, Melbourne University. And then if we get, uh, get time at the end, um, I'll uh, fill you in on the, uh, the Science Week competition that we ran during National Science Week in August where we were asking uh, school kids across Australia to estimate how many craters are on the moon. And uh, that has been uh, quite interesting. So let's begin with uh, what the society's done uh, since uh, we last met. 
Uh, on the 28th of August, we had a committee meeting, and if there was anything groundbreaking coming out of the committee meeting, we'd uh, fill you in on that, but uh, there wasn't. Um, so uh, we also, on the same night, had a, had a UK visitor uh, here at the observatory from uh, Bedfordshire Astronomical Society, which is uh, very close to Cambridge Uni. And so we, uh, fortunately for her, it started off um, fairly cloudy, but then opened up very nicely. So um, uh, she and her daughter were able to actually see the night sky. So we showed them that prior to uh, the committee meeting and she went away really, really happy. Unfortunately, she couldn't send us any photos until she gets back home. So she didn't have the technology to pass them on from her, uh, her camera. Then uh, on the 31st of August and the day afterwards, there was the annual GEM uh, mineral and meteorite uh, show held in Mornington this year. It used to be something that's held annually in Cranbourne, but they've now moved permanently to Mornington. So it will be down here uh, from this point forward. And uh, some of the meteorites you can actually see in the cabinet uh, on the outside there that, uh, that we've actually started selling uh, as well. On the 3rd of September, we were invited down to Merricks on the Mornington Peninsula for uh, a school where we've done a few long distance viewing nights for in the past, Strathcona. And that's a, a girls' school. We had 33 there, and they were really lucky at uh, having absolutely no cloud at all. And as you see from the feedback there that we got from um, the uh, the coordinator of the camp, uh, they were very impressed with, uh, with what we have. And uh, I ha have to agree with his um, his observation that uh, the students were otherwise hard to engage, uh, certainly during the talk. But uh, once they did get engaged, they were asking lots and lots of questions once once they were warmed up. So there's nothing like being at the long end of a long day on camp on the second day of camp and then have to sit inside in the dark listening to me talk before going outside to the telescopes in the cold. But they came away, uh, I think we were the, um, the highlight of their entire camp of all the people that they had visiting and talking and activities and that, so that was pretty impressive. Uh, on the 6th of September, we were mostly clouded out and we almost filled the room. If it had been uh, pouring with rain and hailing, I'm sure we would have filled the room twice over. It uh, tends to happen here. We tend to get more people turn up when you can't actually use the telescopes outside. Uh, go figure that one out. Uh, on the 11th of September, we were down at uh, Frankston South uh, at the uh, Scout Hall of uh, uh, Baden Powell, in Baden Powell Drive. And we had about 55 there of uh, their young uh, cubs and uh, joeys mainly and uh, it was fairly thin cloud and certainly observable uh, for uh, anything we wanted to look at in the night sky from there so that, that went really well. Then uh, on that Friday on the 13th uh, we had our quarterly scouts, cubs and guides night and uh, this one was interesting we were expecting 75 and 102 showed, showed up. Uh, they, uh, uh, the, the biggest group came from uh, Ringwood East so they, they had uh, quite a commute to get here to the observatory we had a, a smaller contingent uh, booked in from Astonborough, and then we had about another 30 odd from uh, Sorrento and Tukaruk, who I don't think booked in at all. They just sort of uh, came from nowhere, and in fact, even today, I'm not sure if they even paid. So, <laughs> so um, I, I was up here talking and watching all the chairs filling up, uh, anticipating have quite a few uh, blank ones, and we were pulling out the white chairs at the back as well. Uh, last month, because it was such a jam-packed uh, month in August, uh, with Science Week and that, we didn't actually have a uh, working bee and uh, barbecue, but we will have uh, shortly. So, before we uh, next meet here, we have, um, if uh, you're on East Scorpius, you would have seen Anders's uh, email notifying about uh, a working bee and uh, barbecue this Saturday night, uh, uh, starting, well, Saturday afternoon, starting at four o'clock. And uh, we might also be getting another UK visitor coming along from there. With uh, the working bee and the barbecue, we're looking for obviously people to come along and help out in any way with uh, the barbecue uh, and with the uh, working bee, uh, try and sort of uh, um, spread the load over as many people as possible. So do come along. It's, uh, if you don't need any big technical skills, we'll show you what to do and uh, where to go uh, with that. Uh, we may also have another UK visitor from Wessex uh, Astronomical Society coming along as well. So we seem to be uh, being seen by people overseas uh, at the moment. Uh, on the 25th, we have the next uh, committee meeting here in uh, the observatory. Um, then the Murchison Meteorite celebrations that uh, weekend, actually for three days, starting on uh, the Friday. 4th of October, we've got the public night here. 
and uh, we're already starting to get bookings uh, for that. Daylight savings then dutifully kicks in and uh, helps make things all a bit uh, later for us after that point. And then we're in daylight savings until April next year. Then we're back here on the 16th. Now, slightly after the next meeting, these two viewing nights have actually come in uh, literally today, confirmed. 17th of October, so the day after we're here for the next monthly meeting, we've got a uh, school from Roeville is on camp at Safety Beach. Uh, so we're going, going down there to visit them. And also Dorinia Primary, this is one that was going to invite us along to a viewing night with 820 students present. Uh, but uh, got cold feet um, when they realised that the moon wasn't in the sky that evening. Uh, but uh, we've got a smaller group of uh, 26 uh, staying in the camp next door, the Bride Education Camp, so they'll just wander over to us, so it'll be nice and uh, convenient. <coughs> okay, and with that, I might hand over to um, our visitor, Associate Professor Daniel Price, who's no stranger here, he's been here before. Uh, I up in so I'm a local team, so it's a great pleasure to be here. Inspiration from Peter's talk to the cuffs. Um, can, can I ask Pat, can you hear Daniel okay from the back, or would you like him no, to put the headset on? I'll put the headset on, it's alright. So I wanted to I wanted to touch, I wanted to make a connection tonight between uh, so what, what you can see with a small telescope and what we're seeing with the biggest telescopes in the world. So if I make that connection successfully, it's a good night. Otherwise, you can go home and still catch who wins the bachelor. <laughs> Which is what my daughter's daughter wants. Wins or loses? Well, yes, <laughs> perhaps. So that's the right room. So just turn this on. Hello? Just, yeah, there we go. We're real loud enough. Huh? All right. It's probably good for your good ear, Ian. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right, I'll just make sure we've got some audio as well and get started. Um, well, so the topic is planet hunting, and again, so I wanted to try and make this connection between the planets in our solar system and the planets that we've started looking for, and I wanted to make it personal as well, um, so I'm going to give you some things which are not even published yet, and you shouldn't even show anyone, they're as top secret as you can get, um, which, you know, probably even if you showed it to your mum, she wouldn't know. Um, what she's looking at anyway, so it'll be fine. <laughs> um, but let's go from um, where we are. We know um, that we live on a planet. It's called the Earth. And one of the things we'd like to know is how we got here. Uh, so already in Peter's um, already mentioned, the Murchison meteorite, uh, we think simply from looking at the sky, we, we know that our planet is not the only one. So these are discoveries made 400 years ago. Um, or a bit less, um, you know, that we have other planets in the sky. Now, this is there's nothing really good about this diagram, um, except that it's colourful. Um, but one of the things that's already striking about the planets in the sky, and actually we were doing this the other night at the Cubs night, is well, how do you find Jupiter and Saturn? Well, they're kind of in a line, right? And that they orbit in a in a plane. Um, now, what does that tell you? So why do they orbit in the same plane? Is it all the the right, so that is the hypothesis. So the, the hypothesis is that they were formed in some kind of swirling disk material around the young sun. Uh, and that's how the situation has stood for a long time. And what's new is that we can now see these swirling disks of material not around the sun, but around other stars. And so that's that's where my part of the game comes in. That's what's exciting in the last few years. We've finally got images of these places where we think the solar system was formed in such a place. But we now have pictures of these places uh, where other solar systems are currently being made. 
Um, so that's the, the new part. Um, I would, before I moved on from the solar system, uh, I just wanted to cover a couple of topics which I think are um, interesting. Um, so first of all, what else do we know in the solar system? Um, well, actually, the, some, of the, some of the techniques that were used to detect planets in the solar system are actually quite similar to the techniques that we've been using to, to look for planets around other stars. So, for example, does anyone know how, say, uh, planets beyond Jupiter and Saturn were discovered? Gravitational anomalies with the, uh, the known planets. Yep, so they were discovered by um, basically disturbances in the orbit of the known planets. So the fact that there's other planets in the solar system, well, I'll come to it, but essentially this is the same way we look for planets around other stars. They have a gravitational effect, and that effect is still measurable, even though you can't see the planet necessarily, you can see its effect on the other things in the solar system. So that helps us look for planets around other stars. Um, something else that you might see um, with a small telescope, such as I'm now the proud owner of, um, and when you look at Jupiter, what, what do you see? And I was actually, I learned something really good the other night um, because uh, maybe it was even Jamie um, made a comment like, or maybe it, was, no, it might have been Peter, said, oh, Io was there, but now it's gone behind. I thought, how the heck can something move behind Jupiter that fast? But it's true, Io's period is, what, two days? So, you know, every 12 hours it does a quarter of an orbit. And so that's obviously what got Galileo arrested in the first place, was watching things orbit something other than us, mm -hmm. uh, told him that we are clearly not the centre of the universe because we've got bodies orbiting another object. And that's what tipped Galileo in favour of the heliocentric model, that things are orbiting the sun, or could even orbit Jupiter. Um, so what about the moons? Where do they come from? So, well, so presumably they come from the same kind of idea, this idea of discs around planets. And, well, not to spoil the punchline, but actually uh, about three months ago we published the first evidence for the detection of one of these circumplanetary discs around a newborn planet. So that's pretty exciting. Um, it's still a bit up in the air, you can see it's not, it's evidence, I wouldn't say it's, a, it's, it's definitely not a picture. Um, but we'll get there. There's a couple other things in the solar system which are interesting. Um, so you'll notice that even in this picture, Pluto's been demoted. Um, and just for the Pluto lovers, also, well, let's let's flick through a couple of things I just mentioned. So obviously this is Jupiter. Um, but one of the interesting things, well, first of all, is the planets in the solar system are not all the same. So we do have these massive gas giant planets. Um, but we're going to see that other solar systems are already nothing like the solar system. So we have Jupiter in a 12-year orbit, which is you know, five times the distance from the Earth from the Sun. But other solar systems, um, we were not expecting them to be like they turn out to be. Uh, so, you know, so we also have um, not just Jupiter, but it has these very large moons. Um, so Saturn is relevant to this process because Saturn still has a ring of a disk of material orbiting it. Out of which, what happens in Saturn's rings? It's by the moon. So it's not just collected by the moons, we actually think the Saturn's rings are actually forming moons. Uh, now that's a bit controversial, um, we don't fully understand how Saturn's rings work. But one of the really obvious features in Saturn's rings is this um, gap in the middle of the, the rings. Now Saturn's rings is not quite the same as what we think the solar system formed from because it's extremely thin. So when I say extremely thin, it's crazy thin. Uh, so the aspect ratio, which is you know the how far that way compared to how far that way, is is 10 million. Um, so it's 10 million times thinner than it is wide. Uh, and that is interesting because we're starting to see things <coughs> Uh, in other solar systems where we're imaging this kind of um, disk but it's not made of, it's not as thin as it is in Saturn's rings but it is um, like 100 to 1 instead of 10 million to 1. 100 to 1 is still pretty thin. Um, tidal forces break that up, that moon could break it up. Sure. Yeah, and which goes to the edge of the, edge of the ring. 
Yeah, so we think that moons are kind of forming and being destroyed. Yes. Um, there's some sort of continuous... So one of the new things from the, the Cassini um, flybys of Saturn is we actually got to weigh the rings. And uh, that means, so basically the flyby flew in between the rings and Saturn, and that means you can separate the gravity of Saturn from the gravity of the rings. And that gave us a, a mass estimate of the rings, and that mass estimate is interesting because it's exactly the mass you expect from those rings basically acting like this disk of material that kind of funnels material in towards Saturn. Um, so, it's a, so they're very young objects, um, which is the kind of new picture, and the speculation about the origin, maybe those rings originated in the disruption of a comet, for example, um, that was stripped and you know, shredded into a, a disk, but no one's quite sure. Uh, but the interesting thing is the gap, and you can see that that's going to be relevant to looking at uh, the formation of other solar systems as well. Now, what causes the gap in Saturn's rings? Yep, so that's caused by um, the presence of large bodies, large compared to the size of the particles in the rings. Um, all right, so, uh, well, I, I can't go past Titan without just mentioning something about it. Uh, if you don't know anything about Titan, it's a wonderful place, uh, as we tell the kids. Um, you know, it's got lakes, it's got rivers, what a nice place to be. It's got weather. Just a little bit chilly. A little bit chilly. Rivers are made of fart gas. You know, um, but there really are lakes and rivers. Uh, so, you know, these are the pictures from the Huygens probe. Uh, you can see these kind of river uh, features into this kind of dark, um, lanky like thing. And that's the picture that the Huygens lander took when it landed with a bit of a splat uh, in this kind of sort of muddy basin or something. And it died shortly afterwards, so that's all we know. But um, there's definitely interesting places in the solar system already. Um, one thing about Pluto before we move on as well, why is Pluto no longer a planet? The interesting reason? The moon's clearly absorbent. I mean, those are all things that were known when Pluto was discovered. Philosophical reasoning. It's not just philosophical reasoning. Why was Pluto demoted? What, but what pushed that decision? So Pluto was fine and space we had we had Pluto as just an extra little odd thing at the end of the solar system. But what triggered the decision to downgrade? Because they downgrade? discover a lot of other um, smaller bodies. Perfect. So the, the trigger was, was actually a good reason. And the trigger was these discoveries of many things beyond Pluto. And some of them are bigger than Pluto. Um, and so the question was, well, what are we going to call all these things? Are we going to start calling all these things planets? Or do we want to just downgrade Pluto and call them all dwarf planets and things? And so the decision was really made to downgrade Pluto because discovery of all these what you call trans-Neptunian objects, um, like Makemake and Sedna and Quark. Pluto got, Pluto got there first. Pluto definitely got there first, but we think... That's right, although we've got lots of things you get. If you're at the MCG, the first up, you get the best seat, don't you? <laughs> Look, I'm not going to take any responsibility for demoting Pluto. It's beautiful. Um, but I think it's still an interesting reason that this you know, the solar system has been around for a long time, but there's still a lot of discoveries to be made about um, what's out there and what's left behind it. And I don't know if you know any of the speculation about Planet Nine, so there's speculation about the orbits of a bunch of trans-Neptunian objects are all a bit strange. And one of the possible hypotheses is that there is a much larger body very far out in the solar system that hasn't been discovered yet. And that's still a live hypothesis. It's, um, I mean, there's no direct evidence for Planet Nine yet, but it's um, quite seriously, it's been taken very seriously as an idea. Um, all right, so let's talk about um, planets around in other solar systems, so this is the planet hunting business, and I want to come back to you know um, this business about how our solar system fits into this picture. So hopefully you may know or may not know what the first. You have to be careful when you say first. So the first um, planet discovered around a normal star, and this you have to make that qualification because in 1992 there was some planets discovered around a neutron star which is this super dense, um, crazy dense thing that's almost a black hole, that's not a normal place to live. Um, and those planets, nobody has any idea how they got there or what they are or anything really. Um, but they were discovered in a few years before this one. This is when I left high school. So when I left high school, didn't know about any other planets around any other stars. 
And really, you can speculate between every star has a planet and none of them do. Uh, so we had no idea how a common planet formation was in the universe, if our solar system is the only one out there, if we've got an empty galaxy of things. This was probably the most boring science you could do. Now, in a scientific sense. So actually, this is one of the things that um, amateur societies are really playing a good role in, because it is a bit boring. Um, not that amateur society is boring. I'm digging myself into a hole here. Um, but one of the things that's you know um, not very interesting for professional astronomers anymore is just monitoring binary stars. Um, you know, because there's a lot of binaries in the sky. There's just a lot to do. Um, actually, it's coming back because of the planet hunting business. Uh, we're getting now these massive surveys of things. But monitoring binary stars was not flash science back in 1995. And the idea that you could detect a planet this way was um, wild. Uh, no one was expecting uh, anything like this. So, uh, so what, what's the idea? So the idea is that the Earth doesn't simply orbit the Sun. What do I mean by that? The, the Sun, they, they both orbit each other. Now what that means is the Sun is much heavier than the Earth, or Jupiter. Solar system, you can forget about all the planets, just think about Jupiter and the Sun. Jupiter's the big guy, and everyone else is irrelevant. Uh, so basically the Sun, well, so here's the movie. Um, I've given away the punchline. Um, but so 51 Pegasus is this kind of um, planet that's very close to its host star, and the host star just kind of wobbles backwards and forwards every four days. And that wobble is detectable, so it's detectable because you see the Doppler shift of the star. So you take a spectrum of the starlight, so spectrum just means take the light from the telescope, put it through a prism, and you can see you know, red through to violet. Um, and you can see, based on well whether the star is moving towards or away from us, that that spectrum shifts slightly and it shifts backwards and forwards every four days. Now four days, what's wrong with that? Well, how does it take Jupiter to go around the sun? 12 years. Uh, how long is four days? It's a lot less than 12 years. And when you, uh, what you get out of this is once you know the inclination, um, which we actually know in this case, uh, you know the mass of the planet. And so you know that there's a planet that's roughly the mass of Jupiter, and it's in a four-day orbit. So instantly everyone went home, and, so their theories about planet formation in the solar system, like how do we get the planets in the solar system? Well, you know, the rocky planets formed in close and the giant planets formed out here. Well, that's out the window. Uh, and so the big buzzword after 51 Peg was discovered was migration. So planets have to move around because no one has any idea and still doesn't have any idea about how to make a planet uh, like Jupiter in a four day orbit around a star. In fact, this planet shouldn't even survive. Uh, so this coined a new term, which was hot Jupiters, the Jupiter mass planets in four day orbits. And there turned out to be plenty of them. Um, so not that they're the most common type of planet, but they're very easily detectable. I'll say easily. Uh, I mean, this was, um, this is really not a very difficult measurement. So the 50 meters per second up and down is the wobble of the star basically. And that's sort of, that's detectable with our small telescope at Monash, um, you know, just across the off, across Blackburn Road. So it's not a particularly difficult measurement. You've got to get lucky on the star and know that it's got a planet there, but it's, um, it's not especially tricky. So we've got a lot better at that. Um, and you, if you followed anything about planets around other stars, uh, you know about this one. I mean, there's some really crazy things out there. So um, that game has gone from detecting a single planet like that, um, but once you've got rid of this wobble and you're sure what it is, you can subtract that and look for a wobble on top of a wobble, a wobble on top of a wobble, wobble on top of a wobble, wobble on top of a wobble, and you keep going and you end up with something like this. So you notice these are all artist's impressions because um, we don't know uh, what the planets actually look like. But we know from radio biases what you learn is, is how massive the planets are. So you can tell how heavy they are by the amount of wobble they juice on the star. So TRAPPIST-1, you know, you've got the system of very tightly packed planets that are all um, orbiting extremely close to the star. 
in this as bad, as tightly packed as you can get. Has anyone ever played Super Planet Crash, the game? Well, when you get home, um, there's a little online game called Super Planet Crash, and your game is to simply place planets in orbit, and you've got to make the solar system survive. In fact, it's one of the things, actually, for the solar system, uh, I think it's pretty much settled now, but more than three bodies in orbit around each other tends to not be stable. That's one of the, um, the long, hard lessons of um, you know, doing physics, is people thought we can solve two stars going around each other. I mean, basically Newton did that and Kepler. And they thought, what if we do three stars going around each other? And it took the best mathematicians hundreds of years to figure out that basically a lot of the time it just doesn't work. So one of the guys just gets booted out, the whole thing is unstable. And so the same is true with the solar system, you've got eight and a half bodies, or nine bodies. Uh, no one's quite sure if that's going to be really stable for the age of the universe, or if suddenly the planets are going to go whoosh and you know, fire each other off to infinity. So you can play the same with super planet crash, you can, the challenge is to make the planets stay there and not kick each other off to infinity um, in some reasonable time. And so something like Trappist uh, is, it's a miracle. How did these planets all orbiting without kicking each other out? So the answer is basically they're all in resonance with each other. So they're like, Ju like Pluto and Neptune. Pluto comes inside Neptune's orbit, um, but they're in a three to two resonance. So you know, every three orbits, the other one does two. And so that's, they're always perfectly timed to never actually crash into each other. So that's the same thing with these guys. They're called resonantly packed. They're, in these resonances with each other, which makes sure they never kick each other off to infinity. <coughs> All right, so that's Trappist. Um, but the real discovery machine um, was not with the radial velocity method, which is this wobble of the star. The real discovery machine was transits. So does anyone know what a transit is? Well, hands up if you saw the transit of Venus. That's pretty good, pretty good show. All right, so transit is very simple again. It's simply the planet just passes in front of the star. And as the planet passes in front of the star, then the starlight um, dips. Um, and you can detect, although it's, um, it's a very small amount, because the planet's a very small uh, shadow cast on the star, all you have to detect is that little dip and the rise again, and it comes around you know, every time the planet goes around. So um, you can play the same game with multiple planets, and you just get multiple dips here. Now the challenge here is simply that the dip in the starlight is not very much. So it's the ratio of the area. But that's already interesting because you learn something different to what you get from the wobble. So from the wobble, what do you learn? Yes. You, get, you get the weight, so you get the mass. But from this one, you really get the size. Yep, so you have no idea how heavy it is, but you know how big it is. So if you can put those two things together, then you can start to learn about, uh, that's when you get these statements in the media like, is it a water world, or is it a rocky thing, or a gassy thing? We don't really know if it's a rocky thing or a gassy thing, but we can measure its density, because we've got its mass, and we've got its size, and so you can say, is it got the density of rock, or has it got the density of gas? Yep. So one gram per centimetre cubed, that's the density of water, that must be a water world. <coughs> so it doesn't necessarily mean it has water on it. So transit method went um, well, it was demonstrated um, not long after 51 Pegasus was discovered, um, but it turned into a machine from this telescope called the Kepler telescope, which was designed specifically just to stare at this patch of sky uh, near the galactic center. So it's a very crowded star field. <coughs> and it just simply stared at that patch of sky full time until its <coughs> wheels broke. Now the goal of Kepler was to image, was to find planets like the Earth. Now how long do you need to be in orbit for to find planets like the Earth? Well you want a year to get one dip. But see one dip you can never tell if it's a thing that's going to repeat or not. So to repeat you need three dips. You need to have seen it twice and then predict that it's going to come back and see it the third time. How long was Kepler up in the sky for before it wheels broke? about two and a half years. <laughs> so it was almost there, and then the gyroscope failed and it went all wobbly. Um, so that wasn't the end of the Kepler discovery mission. 
um, because they were figuring out a very clever way of like um, of keeping it pointed by using the radiation pressure from the sun. So it's basically on its side, um, pointing at the sky. But they they managed to figure out that if they pointed it the right way, uh, they could keep it balanced, um, but they couldn't look at the same patch of sky all the time, which turned out to be great, because everyone was sick of staring at the same patch of the sky, and they wanted to look at other patches of the sky. Um, so Kepler was basically pointed along the ecliptic, and just for the last sort of year or so of its mission, it was staring at this one sort of curve of sky, which is all it could look at by staring at the ecliptic as it went around. Um, so discoveries continued, but not... Um, so we couldn't get longer than the two and a half year baseline because you're looking at different patches of sky. Um, but that turned out to be great for lots of other reasons. Um, and so Kepler gave us a, a bunch of wonderful things which are all discovered with the transit method. So planets passing in front of the stars. Uh, so things like Kepler 62, um, this has got you know, five planets and that's um, kind of to scale. So they're all you know, basically within the orbit of, um, of the Earth. So there's, I mean, the Earth, we only have Venus and Mercury in there. So again, we see that there's plenty of solar systems that which are absolutely nothing like our own. Now, does that mean the solar system is typical or, or unusual? Well, we don't know. So it's a very strongly biased discovery methods, mm. and that's part of the problem. So we couldn't see our own solar system. We can't detect the Earth yet because we haven't been up there for three years. So we couldn't. We can't actually detect our own solar system equivalent in the sky yet. So it's a very biased view of what the other solar systems look like because we're just detecting the ones that are easy to find. Uh, so that's been part of the problem. But the methods have been spectacularly successful. So here's a little. Um, animation of, uh, well, not all of them, but a bunch of planetary systems detected with Kepler. Where's Trappers? So Trappers was not detected with Kepler, so it's not, not in this one. So these are kind of all on their real orbits. You can see the... Um, there's a weird, wonderful variety of things out there. So you can see what astronomers do with your taxpayers' money. <laughs> um, so there's a bit of politics um, here as well. I mean, the bit of politics was, was basically the radial velocity method was pioneered by Europeans. And the Americans were getting a bit beaten to this game. So they thought, well, what can we do? Let's just nail it. Um, and so with Kepler, the game was just numbers, right? They just wanted to dominate the number of planets discovered. And other people felt this was a bit kind of a little bit useless because one of the things about the Kepler field, it was so far away that you had no chance of ever following that up with radial velocities. So that meant below you know the size of the planets you know, from the transits, you don't know the mass because you could never follow that up with um, the wobble method. Um, but in terms of sheer numbers, Kepler answered a particular question very well, which is how many other stars have planets? If we stare at this patch of stars, there's 100,000 stars, how many of them did we detect planets with? A lot. How many, if we were more sensitive, you know, how many do we think we missed because we've got this very biased selection? We can kind of do the statistics and work out how many stars in the sky probably have planets and what kind. So in terms of sheer numbers, I mean, this is um, 51 Pegasus, the neutron star planets right here. Um, 
This is the you know, discovery of Pigfield Pegasus 1995. And Kepler came along in 2014 and took the numbers from something like you know, a couple of hundred up to, um, well, that's still Kepler, that big peak in 2016, up to uh, more than 3,000. So the, the kind of business of you know, finding planets around other stars, you know, we can do it. In terms of the question, how many planets, how many stars have planets? Pretty much. Yep, so you can give that, you can drill that down to kind of some numbers like this. So this is a fraction of stars with at least one planet. So um, at least 15% of stars have an Earth-like planet. Um, the most common type of planet turned out to be a bit of a surprise, and that brings us back to the Planet Nine story. Because the most common kind of planet discovered so far is something we don't have in the solar system, and that's what's called a super Earth. So a super Earth is something like 1.2 to 2 times the mass, uh, the size of Earth, sorry, in this diagram. Um, it's a little bit heavier than the Earth. Um, and it, if it becomes too heavy, you start calling it a mini Neptune. I'm not sure where that boundary lies exactly, but um, at some point it seems nicer to talk about mini Neptunes compared to super Earths. Uh, but the most, so the most common type of planet, 20% of stars would have a super Earth. And the speculation is that the planet 9, if it's there, would be something like a super Earth. So maybe we do have one, but it's far away and we haven't discovered it yet. Uh, so that would be interesting. <coughs> and then the gas giants, you know, seem to be relatively rare. Um, but of course, and so when you run the numbers and you say, well, what, which ones have we missed? Basically, you get this answer that all stars in the sky have planets. Um, well, the number's actually around 70%, but I'll take, I'll round up 70% to 100. It's good enough. I mean, basically all of them. Uh, and again, there's plenty of funky stuff, um, which looks absolutely nothing like the solar system. So. Um, while the solar system may not be special, it's definitely, it's definitely not the only kind of solar system you can have. So there's plenty of weird stuff. Uh, this is Kepler-90. You see there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight planets, same number as the solar system. Now these, these distances are definitely not to scale, but the sizes are to scale. So it's got you know, two planets that are big or, well, sort of a Saturn and a Jupiter equivalent, but even bigger. Um, so that's going to bring us back to our final story as well. <coughs> and of course the real game is, is there anything living on these planets? And so you can't play that game yet, so we can't... We're probably better off playing that game in our own solar system, because we could at least in principle go to Titan and look for fish in the methane rivers or something. But here what we're really saying is these potentially habitable planets are got to have the right, the right size and mass, or at least the right size, because Kepler, a lot of them, we don't know the mass. Um, and then they've got to be far enough away from the star that they don't get roasted. That's pretty much the criteria for potentially habitable. And there's a bunch of candidates. And the game really has been with transits to try and push down to that Earth mass and Earth size kind of planet that we didn't quite get to um, with the main Kepler mission. And so that's still kind of the game with these radial velocities, which is this wobble method and the transits is to still try to get that Earth equivalent. And so you, the press releases keep going like, you know, a 1 and a 1.2 times the mass of Earth, or, you know, we've now got Earth mass planets, but, you know, very close to the star. So the game is to find an Earth mass planet in an Earth-like orbit. So we're not quite there yet, but we're getting closer um, as the months go on. All right, so there's one other, so I'm not going to mention some of these other discovery methods. So you can see the third one there is called Pulsar, which is not one that's been repeated. That was the, the planets around the neutron star. Um, there's a, well, so these, these other two are still transit method. There's something called transit timing variations, which is interesting. It's a way of discovering multiple planets. It's basically if your eclipse doesn't come back at the same time, it's maybe because there's something else that's having a bit of a gravitational influence. So we mentioned that in the solar system, that's the way that some of the other planets were discovered. So that's the same kind of thing with uh, multi-planet systems. You can see by the fact that the eclipse doesn't come back at exactly the same time, that something else is disturbed, mucking things around. Now, it's a little bit hard to disentangle, but that's one of the ways that you find these multi-planet systems. 
Now, there's a couple of things left there. There's other. Actually, I don't know what other is. Um, but microlensing is something a bit weird, um, and you basically only catch it once and you never catch it again. But that's basically lensing due to gravity. So a planet passes in front of the star, acts like a lens on the star, the star brightens and then dims again, uh, and then you never see the planet ever again. Um, so that's, well, it's been done. It's very small numbers here. But there's one which is even more obvious, um, which is part of the story I want to tell tonight as well, which is take pictures. So why is this hard? So the real problem is the stars are really bright. And if you try to look at the sun, it hurts your eyes. And if you try to look at the sun with a telescope, which is one of the first things you're told not to do, uh, it's even worse. So what you're really trying to do is look at a star, block out the starlight and look at the faint thing next to it. And the kind of contrast ratios you're trying to achieve are something like a firefly next to the sun. You know, a very short separation. So this is what makes it difficult to find directly image planets. Um, but this, um, this kind of whole idea got a super boost in sort of 2007, 2008 when this picture came out. And this was a really spectacular discovery. It's the first image of another solar system. It's called HR8799. And you can see there's these four dots. Now there's a bunch of speckles, and this is important because this is part of the trickiness about subtracting the star, is subtracting the star is a tricky business. And what, you, what you're trying to do is delete all the starlight, but the starlight can be a bit noisy. So when you delete it, you get left with a bunch of speckly dots. Uh, some of those speckly dots look like planets. Um, but if you do a good job, you can see that you know, there's some dots that definitely don't look like speckly noise. Maybe this one's a bit marginal because you've got some other dots here that they're very close to the mask, and so they're probably not real. Now, HR8799, that was, has been monitored for a number of years. This is a movie up to 2016. And you can see, you know, clearly these bodies are orbiting. So everyone went fantastic. This is amazing. We've got these, uh, so this is a solar system. It's got four, 10 times the mass of Jupiter planets. They're at large separation from the star. This game's going to be easy. Guess how many more since 2007? Systems like HR8799 have been imaged. Zero is the right answer. But everyone got so excited that they went and made these really fantastic imaging instruments for deleting the light from the star and looking at the faint stuff around it. What are those instruments also good for? Well, so you have, we've basically found no more of those. And that's not because the instruments are bad, it's just simply because that seems to be a rare thing. So having these very massive planets for a big... Yep. The new instruments, have they gone back and looked at this system? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. And they've confirmed... The yeah, yeah, and this is the easy one. Yeah, yeah, you can go back and there's more and more same images of HR8799, but I heard a talk recently, I and mean, we've spent so many hours, so this instrument is called, it's, so we use acronyms. So the telescope is the Very Large Telescope, and the instrument's called the SPEAR instrument, which also stands for something, but I don't know what that stands for. But it's basically the instrument, so the Very Large Telescope, actually Jim was telling me, went to, um, went to Chile earlier this year, but, so it's on Paranel in Chile. Um, there's actually four telescopes that make up the Very Large Telescope. <laughs> but Sphere is the instrument for basically doing this business of deleting the starlight. And the other thing you have to do is correct for the atmosphere very sensitively. So the atmosphere also gives you a bit of jiggling around. So it's an adaptive optics, and the coronagraph is the business about blocking the starlight. Um, and there's some other little fancy things too, but it's a really a wonderful instrument. But it was built to do that. And there's basically been, they've spent hours and hours and hours looking for things like that, and they've got like a couple of maybes. And they're so unspectacular that I haven't even listed them um, because they're really not very spectacular images. There's maybe one dot-like thing. Um, so there's been a few that are confirmed, but it's really, really been a horrible story for like, you know, hoping that this thing is going to be common. How many would they image at one time? Sorry? How many would they be able to image at one time? Oh, it's not 
Well, so it's not particularly well. hard work, but when you don't see anything, then you want to image for longer. So, you know, this thing, I don't think <coughs> very long integration time, for example. But when you see nothing, then you say, well, instead of one hour, can I have 10 hours? And so they give you the entire night, and you still find nothing, and you say, well, can I go back the next night, and can I have another night looking at it? And eventually you've spent 100 nights looking at this thing, and you still haven't found anything. And that's basically the game. Um, which you'll see is our game too. But the, the consequence, so the, the ratio of an amount of time spent looking for these things and the amount of spent, time spent doing this other stuff is about a factor of 10. So they spent, you know, for every 100 hours spent looking for planets, they spent like, actually probably more like 100, like a one hour um, doing this kind of stuff. And this is imaging what we call young stars. Well, I'm gonna go back on the story about young stars. But imaging young stars is really beautiful because they've got this swirling disk of stuff around them where we think our solar system came from. Now, this has got nothing to do with really discovering planets, but it's other stuff which is faint material around the star that if you subtract the star, you can see it. And so there are other good targets for these kind of instruments. And we've got all this weird stuff. We've got, you know, subtracting starlight, We've got these sort of nice little sort of spiral army things. We've got these sort of spiral arm things. We've got these really um, kind of great images. It's so great that in one night you can do this. So this is just one night on the VLT. It's the most spectacular. It was just very good conditions this night. Not very long on each source. But this is the, I love this name. This is the star called I and Loopy. Really, it's up there. <coughs> I am Loopy. And it doesn't take a lot of imagination to see what this is. So what you're really seeing is this, uh, what Peter showed in his earlier slide, which is this um, solar nebula type thing, which is this big booming swirling disk of material around the star. So these kind of images are stuff that, as a PhD student, I, these were like fictional, you know, artists' impressions of what these things would look like. Now we've got actual images. So the new part about that is now if we think about where planets came from, we've actually got images of where planets come from. At least where we think they come from. We think we, they come from these disks of material around stars. This is just last year. Look at all these pictures. What are they telling us? So already you can see some things in the images on the left. You look hard and close. Well, so you're seeing what you're seeing is the star. So this disc is, has this sort of flared structure. So you can see this kind of bowl, and this what you're seeing is the disc doesn't actually emit much light itself. It's just the starlight reflecting off the surface. So actually, it's very small yeah. dust grains caught um, that catch the starlight. Um, so that's what you're seeing. That's why it looks very bright here. And that's why it's in shadow here, is because that part just doesn't receive the starlight because it's sh you know shadowed from the other parts. So definitely it's got two sides. Yeah. So the material's swirling around the star. But I want you to look even closer at the one on the left in particular. Well, actually, you see in the one on the right as well, which is a bit harder to make out what that is. Gap. Yep. So it's got these kind of rings. The start of the gap. Yeah. And so that brings us back to this thing about Saturn's rings. Now, it's not very, so scattered light um, is what these, obs these kind of observations are called, because you're seeing the scattered starlight off the nearby material. Um, it turns out to be like really sensitive to small things. So if you make a little shadow in you know, something near the star, it will just give you big dark shadows across the whole thing. So it's very sensitive to some things, but it makes it very hard to understand in some cases. So for example, this one is not very well zoomed in, but you can see Actually, there's a sort of shadow here and here. Uh, and what's causing those shadows, we think, is material very close to the star that's in some sort of messy, um, mucked up configuration. And unpacking that from these kind of images is um, part of the game that I've been playing well, with our computer models. Um, so I'm not going to talk about so much about that tonight. Um, but it is part of this game about um, understanding what these structures are made by. But there's another telescope which has really helped here is, well, one of the things is you can't see inside here. 
and that's because we're in this near infrared, almost optical wavelength. So what we really like to do is be able to see inside. So, so we're going to get a longer wavelength, and so infrared would be good, but the Herschel Space Telescope is dead. So we even better at even longer wavelengths, which gets us to almost the radio band, but this ALMA telescope in Chile. Um, so I'll just tell a, a little bit of context. Um, so where we find these kind of things, this is from one of your members, I believe. Uh, this is the night sky. And so you see these in the Milky Way, you get these clouds like Ophiuchus there, is the dark, this dark river on the sky. So those are the places in the Milky Way where stars are manufactured. What I mean by manufactured? Well, um, we see them as uh, newborn stars. So a newborn star is basically a star with muck around it, which the muck technical definition is infrared excess. But there's a bunch of stars in Ophiuchus in that dark river thing that look weird. And they look weird, well, I was speculating for a long time about why they look weird, but basically there's muck around them, and that muck is in the form of these, well, we now have images, but we, all we had is spectra for a long time. We know that they're basically red stars. And they're red because they have this cold material surrounding the star. And so that's what we call young stars, simply because they're still feeding from the surrounding material. So we think these are stars in the process of formation. So for example, here's Ophiuchus, and we classify them by age, based on basically how much muck there is around the star, it's pretty much all it is. If there's so much muck you can't see the star, we call that class zero. If there's a little bit of muck, we call it class one. If the muck is in the form of a nice, clean, just disk of orbiting material, we call that class two. And if we can't see any muck anymore, but there's a little bit left, we call it class three. And after that, it's just an old star. Um, so that's pretty much what the colors are. It's, you know, how much muck there is around the star. Um, and that's the cloud as it looks in the optical. Um, so what we, well, but what is around all these newborn stars, we didn't really have images. So the best images we had, this is a bad, you might have seen this in previous talks. You've seen the baby and you're seeing, a, you know, stuff, this disk of material around the baby star. So this is the Orion Nebula. And again, you're in sort of these optical near UV wavelengths. And all you see is the shine of shadow of the disk on the background nebula. So you've probably seen the right nebula through a telescope. I hope everyone has here. If you haven't, is it running up in the sky tonight? No? It's a, it's a summer constellation. Yeah. Um, you know, so this is just basically using Hubble zooming in um, up close in Orion. So it's really looking at nebula like this, and this is where Alma's taking us. This is a zoom in on the Taurus Nebula. I've shown this in previous talks, but it helps give a bit of context. So Taurus just looks like one of these dark, you can't even see it, it's just this dark kind of patch in the optical of the sky, it's this dark cloud. And the Angel Tower is just the brightest star in, uh, in a millimeter in Taurus, which is this one here. Fades to the Hubble image. So you can see there's all this muck kind of around it because it's in the process of formation. It's blowing this jet of material. And then we fade to the longer wavelength image, which is this image from the Alma telescope. Right, so I've shown this image in a couple of previous talks because it was really the start of a new era in um, discovery of these kind of things, which is Suddenly, when we got images of this resolution of these wavelengths, we start playing games again. And what does this look like? What does it remind you of? It's rings. So there's been a lot of wild speculation about um, what causes these rings. And again, we think the story is probably connected to planets, but as soon as you put an image like that in front of a bunch of clever people, they come up with all kinds of other ideas about what could cause rings in disks. And so we've had at least 40 different models for what can cause rings in disks in the space of the last four years. So this image is from 2015. Um, but the obvious thing it reminds us of is, um, well, this process of gap carving by moons in Saturn's rings. Now, um, so this is something we've been working on a lot. Oh, hang on, let me just not jump too far ahead. 
But uh, that was the first light image taken with ALMA. Guess what we've been doing since 2015? Well, taking a lot more images like that. Uh, so you can basically do this with every... Um, so those clouds in the Milky Way are relatively nearby. So Ophiuchus, Taurus, they're 140 parsecs, you could walk there. So what does that mean? So in light years, the parsecs, three light years. But think of it as star distance. So star dis distance to the nearest star is like one parsec. So if you think of that as like a metre, yeah, the centre of the galaxy is eight kilometres away. It's a Sagittarius A star. So these, these clouds are kind of 140 metres away. And they're still in the park, you know, whereas the centre of the galaxy is well on the way to Melbourne. So you can basically image all these, um, plenty of these young stars. And these are the ones that have been done so far. We've done 20. This was out earlier this year. We've done 20 at high resolution. Guess what's common? Rings. Now it's very important, and part of our work was to point this out. Pointing out the bleeding obvious gets you a long way in science. But what was really missed from the theoretical understanding of this and why people started speculating is that what you're seeing in these longer wavelengths is the larger dust grains. Now the thing about the larger dust grains is they don't stick to the gas like those, like the ones that scatter the starlight, they're really stuck to the gas. And they just sit there, you know, up in the high latitudes of the disk. But these larger grains, they really decouple. They're more like rocks. And they really sink to the middle. And just like Saturn's rings, that gives you something with quite a thin aspect ratio. So when you're looking at this picture, I and mean, you can see from the zoom from the Hubble image, it's a very thin pancake compared to what you see in the optical. So it's really stuff that's collected in the mid-plane. And that's something really not that far away from Saturn's rings. And when you run models of you know, planets making gaps in this kind of thing, uh, that's exactly what you find, is something more like that. All right, so that's the speculation at least. So what about all these? What are they? Right, so, um, well again, wild speculation ensues. I mean, this is what we have, we have images. But what we really want to know is, is this, you know, are we seeing some sign of what kind of planets have been made in these places? Uh, and is it already finished? Is it in process, in progress? You know, so we did a, what the nice thing was, is what we need is some evidence. Did we, uh, yep. Did we do that to Saturn when we can see the rings on its plane? Did we, did we actually test that theory? At Saturn with its moons? It's very hard to model Saturn. Saturn's rings are almost impossible to model properly. No, not model, but actually look at it yep. from Earth and then check that kind of uh, technique with the moons that are in the rings yep. and check your theories. Yep. Have we done that? Yep. Yep. I mean, the way you do it is, I mean, you can see the moons in Saturn's rings and yep. you can see them. Uh, you can see them making wakes, yeah. I mean, you can see it happening, so you don't... Uh, modelling it turns out to be difficult in Saturn's rings because they're so thin that it's almost impossible to do that in 3D because you need, for every one thing that way, you need like 10 million that way. Um, but yeah, in Saturn's rings it works fine. So, the speculation here is about, maybe these are telling us about the presence of planets, and if they are, then it's interesting. Because if you remember about the planet discovery techniques, what kind of planets do you pick up? Big ones. Big ones where? Close in, close in. Very close to the star in four-day orbits. <coughs> and what we see from imaging, as you already saw in HR8799, you're sensitive to the opposite. You're sensitive to the big guys far away from the star, because that's what you can separate from the starlight. And so here we've got the same kind of scenario. If this is really a planet in here, or there's a planet in here, these are very, probably very large planets, um, a very large separation from the star. Now, these kind of, the size of these kind of things, um, they're whopping. So they're, so Pluto in the solar system is 40 AU astronomical units, so that's 40 times the Earth's sun distance. These things are 100, 150 um, AU in size. 
but partly that's a selection effect. We've just picked, I mean, if you're going to do a survey, you want to pick the 20 most beautiful pictures you're going to find. And so that's really this, the cut here. Let's pick the prettiest 20 and take pictures. So they're not typical at all. In fact, um, one of the other things that's been done is surveys. So if you survey all the stars in Ophiuchus, for example, or in Taurus, and you get a picture of every single disc around every single star, a lot of them are just blobs. And our solar system would look like a blob because it's basically not, well, it would be resolved actually, but it's, um, you know, Pluto's at 40 AU, which would be basically this bit. Now, so we wouldn't see much um, if we were looking, and Jupiter, of course, is a, which is the biggest thing in our solar system, is at 5 AU. So that's um, not where Pluto is. So we wouldn't really see Jupiter's impact. It would look like a, maybe a small hole in the middle rather than being you know, one of these gaps far, far out. All right, so um, fortunately, we don't have to guess. So um, I did mention this last time I came to get a talk, but I want to give an update. So uh, my colleague, um, Christophe Pant, um, so he's a French guy working at Monash. Uh, but this is one of these ALMA images of this disk called HD, not very exciting, 163296. So the left you see this sequence of, of rings, and on the right what you see is a, an image taken. Um, now, these kind of images are kind of tricky to explain, but there's this kind of business about the Doppler shift of the motion of the material orbiting the star. So you can see the material orbiting star, it's made of gas, in fact, what we're imaging is the carbon monoxide line. So it's, you've seen the carbon monoxide, which is like deadly to you in your house, but um, it's, it emits in these wavelengths, at particular wavelengths. And if you image those very particular wavelengths, you can basically map how the material in this disk is moving. Now, we, we kind of know how these things work. It's just gas orbiting a star, so we can make models. And we can make a model where what we do is simply model the material orbiting the star, and we stick a planet in the model. And what happens in this, um, this we call line emission, but this map of basically how fast material is moving around the star, that if there was nothing there, this would just be a perfectly smooth um, line. And you can see it's not, there's this kind of little kink in it that we think is basically something like a disturbance in the force. So there's something which is very local, which is causing the material not to flow around the star in a nice smooth pattern. And well, what is that thing? Well, we think it's a newborn planet. Now the first, so I kind of want to um, not give too much detail on this one because Although this was evidence for a newborn planet, it was not anywhere near this um, disk with all the gaps in it. It was much further out. It was about 130 AU from the star. And it was something like two to three times the mass of Jupiter. So earlier this year, we did one better. I want to see if you can spot it this time. So it's the same kind of map. You've got this map of the... Well, so let me explain a bit more what you're seeing here. So you're seeing the... the basically all those materials orbiting the star, and you're just taking a slice of material at a particular velocity. So it's either moving towards or away from us. Now imagine the stuff is swirling around like this. Some of that's coming towards us, some of it's going away from us. But if you take a particular, I'll say I want everything that's moving towards us at one kilometer per second. And that gives you kind of a weird sort of cross section of material. And that's what this map is. It's just a weird cross-section material where it's like everything moving towards us at one kilometer a second. And so that should give you a nice smooth cut because everything's just orbiting in a nice smooth way. So it should give you a nice smooth kind of banana. And it's the kink in the banana that tells you that not everything's going around in a nice smooth way. All right, you with me? All right, so find me the next one. So I've laid two images on top of each other here. So one is the image of this new one. It's, called, it's the dust disk, is in the blue. So this is this millimetre um, dust with a couple of big gaps in it. Looks like a kink of, on the right overlapping the... Um... So about here? Yeah. Yep, and where would the planet be? Yeah, okay. Probably the 
exactly in the groove. Yep, so this is a new one where we've got evidence for something disturbing the flow and rather than being far outside of this um, groovy disk, it's right bang in the groove. And the way to check is simply, what if you take, so this is everything moving towards us at one kilometre a second. If you look at everything moving away from us at one kilometre a second, that's just going to be the same banana but on this side. So if you look at the same banana on the other side, that's what it is. Well, you shouldn't see anything because there's no planet there. So this is just a nice smooth banana. You with me? Yep. Yep. And there's nothing particularly special going on here because the planet is here. Yep. So that's the confirmation that there's definitely something which is, well, although we can't see the planet, we can see there's something very local that's something in the gap making a disturbance. We can measure its mass because we can make a model and we can read off when we match it to a model, what kind of size body do you need to make this kind of disturbance? Answer something like two or three times the mass of Jupiter. With the information you've got at the moment, do you have an indication of the orbital period? Yep, yep, so we know. So you can wait uh, a quarter of its year and. Oh, well, so <laughs> yeah, the problem again is, is that um, we're a long way from the star here. So Jupiter orbits every 12 years, it's a 5 AU. Oh. And if you take that to, you know, uh, 50, 100 AU, you're talking so hundreds, thousands of years. Yep, so Pluto's orbit at 40 AU takes like 300 years or something. Okay, so um, you're, you're, your ch grandchildren might get to look at this? So <laughs> correct, yeah, yeah. Um, well, it's slightly better than that because once you know where it is, you know the game you're trying to play if you're trying to take an image. All right, so this is the top secret stuff. Um, so that's... That's where we think the planet is in this case. What you really want to know is can we take pictures? So obviously we've put in some time. But it's kind of an even worse game. Oh, actually, I just want to tell the last bit of this story. Um, which is why the direct imaging has been tricky as well. So it's even worse if you're looking for planets when there's already stuff around the star. Because <coughs> I said the game is to subtract the starlight, look at the faint stuff around it. But then this kind of subtracting the starlight, one of the techniques is this very aggressive filtering of everything around the star to only look for dots. And so that's one of the reasons why you end up with these speckling things that look like dots, is you're kind of filtering for only seeing planets. And if you do that, and there's already stuff around the star, you make all the other stuff around the star look like planets. Which I'm going to show you, published in the most prestigious journal in science in a minute, which is total rubbish. Not this one. Uh, so this is um, this is the unpublished images. Um, so this is what we've got from a dedicated night um, a month or two ago. It's not promising. So it's not promising very likely because this planet is probably buried. So it's not only is it two times the mass of Jupiter rather than 10. So HR 8799, those planets were 10 times bigger than Jupiter. But also those planets have got no muck around them. This planet's embedded in a lot of muck. So there's probably stuff on top. So that if you do some very aggressive filtering, there's some promising looking blobs. Um, but there's a lot more work to be done to see if any of these blobs can be trusted or not. And the reason that's a very dangerous game is the following. So we could claim there's blobs there. So if you look at the top right one, you might be convinced that there's a blob in the right spot. But the reason that's difficult is people have been playing the same game with, there's another class of these disks called, we name everything wrong in astronomy. Like, pro, you know, planetary nebulae have nothing to do with planets. Um, what else do you want? Um, Actually, protoplanetary disks, which is the name for these things, uh, one of the things we're learning is probably planet formation is already finished by the time we image them. So actually, they're not protoplanetary, they're kind of planet hosting disks or something like that. So we name everything wrong in astronomy. And one of the things is definitely named wrong is this class of disks called transition disks. Now, they're just disks with a hole in the middle which we haven't had pictures of. Again, this was inferred from the spectrum that there was some kind of hole in the middle. And the speculation was the hole is caused by basically the star starting to evaporate the material from the inside 
you know, and leaving us with something like the solar system where there's not much gas left behind, there's just a bunch of rocks and planets. And so these were thought to be just in transition between, you know, newborn and old, where they've got the hole is the halfway in between. Total rubbish. Um, so the hole, though, turns out to be a good place to start looking for planets because one of the other ways to make a hole is you have some bodies inside that is kind of carving all the material out to make a hole. So this was a really spectacular, um, well, one of these discs with a hole in the middle. This is from 2012. And here's the image from 2015 published in Nature. Three accreting planets in the lit calcium 15 transitional disc. There's three blobs, they all look like planets. One of them, they even had um, hydrogen line, which is a promising sign that it's accreting and therefore bang on. But it turns out that because you've got all this other stuff orbiting the star, when you apply these very aggressive filtering techniques, what you basically see is a bit of reflected starlight that's kind of in an arc shape, and then you filter it and it looks like three blobs. Uh, so this is spectacularly unconfirmed, and there's been about 10 of these where people have claimed directly imaged um, bodies inside these protoplanetary disks, and it's turned out to just be an artifact or something real. So, um, so basically we can't claim anything based on these kind of little blobby things, uh, although we'd like to. Uh, we'd like to have the imaging confirmation that this disturbance in the flow is really caused by a body. It's a very dangerous game when there's other material around. So that said, there has been some success in this area. Yeah. Uh, so there is one that everybody trusts now, and it's just one. It's called PDS-70, and it was first discovered last year. And so here's the image. So again, you can see this kind of disk of material, and here's the blob that everybody now trusts. So again, this is something probably like 10 times the mass of Jupiter, and it's inside this kind of cavity in the middle of this um, protoplanetary disk. Well, so there it is, the first picture of a baby planet. Now, there's a little twist to this tail, eh? which is a nice twist because it's um, so a postdoc in my group um, called Valentin Christians, who's hired from Chile, and he had some data sets on this object. And so he started poking his data sets. Actually, he got scooped, is the real story here. So he got scooped on the actual discovery because his paper was like, you know, submitted and he, um, this, this discovery image came out and it was better than his image, basically. Um, so he got scooped a little bit, but what he got, which no one else had got, which is he had an image at lots of different wavelengths. So what he could get was a spectrum. And the spectrum was interesting of PDS-70. Uh, so the spectrum is this kind of all these um, dotted points. So this is wavelength, this is in the infrared, so this is 2.5 microns, for example, is just the wavelength, so it's the colour, if you like, it's an infrared colour. Now, it's a bit hard because it's a spectrum, it's always hard to talk about spectra, but basically there's some models here where you try to fit the spectra with what you think the, the object is. And so for a star, we know what the spectrum of stars look like, it's a black body spectrum, it's called, it's very easy to fit. And so that sort of thing turns out to not to work very well for this planet and we tried kind of every planet model that we had and this young planet is just too red. So you've seen this story before, why are stars red? Why are young stars too red? But, well, so the definition of a young star is that they have this infrared excess. Why do they have infrared excess? Got a lot of stuff, of stuff around them, it's cold. Yep, so this planet thing has basically an infrared excess compared to what a model for a planet should give you. What might the stuff be around the planet? We think it's good evidence for a second planetary disk. Yep, so that brings us all the way back to that story about Jupiter and why Galileo got arrested. Is he saw the moons of Jupiter orbiting around and speculated about then being formed in some kind of disk material orbiting Jupiter. So now we have actually the first evidence for some swirling material around a newborn planet. That's pretty good. So it's not an image. Well, actually the image is there. You can see it's not quite as good as the other one. Um, but, you know, the spectrum is the new thing and we can learn something about maybe what's happening with moons. All right, so just to summarize, we now think that pretty much all stars have planets. 
and probably a good fraction of them have Earth-like planets too. So that's the technical definition of Earth-like. We're getting our first glimpses of planets being born, so I hope I gave you um, some idea this is a very ongoing story. Um, we've got a first evidence for a certain planetary disk in the last um, few months as well. No aliens yet. Keep an eye. Um, we'll keep an eye. I'll let you know if I discover any. Uh, I just want to give you one more thing, which is yeah, see, watch the space. <laughs> I'm going to give you one other like top secret one, which has not been submitted yet. So you might think this baby planet discovery game. Um, there's lots more possible objects we can look at for this. And so the data set that was used, I'm going to skip right back, the data set that was used, the first big survey, so this is an image of the... Yeah, so this first big survey, there's some products that came with it, which is, this is an image of the dust emission, so this millimetre dust grains. But they did also get these um, gas lines, this CO emission, carbon monoxide emission, that we were using to look for the baby planets. So there's a data set of like 20 disks here, which we can fish in to look for more. Now, it, the survey wasn't done with this kind of discovery in mind, so it's not the best kind of data sets that you want. But we had a look, uh, and this is something we're about to submit this week, hopefully. Hopefully it won't burn like that. Now these are much more tentative than the other ones I've shown you. Oh, just, just disappearing. But there's about nine more. So that's just from this uh, other data set that we've got. They're much more tentative, but it's the same kind of stuff that you've seen before, these little kinks. And the neat thing about these, although they're not necessarily convincing on their own, is every single one of them is in one of these gaps, or at the head of um, a, a spiral arm or something. So we think we're now, well, going from 2 to maybe 10 or 20, we've got really direct evidence that there really are bodies in these spaces. And you are the very latest audience to hear that. So. Yeah. Does uh, anyone have any uh, questions for Daniel? If, if they're not bodies, Yep. What are the other possibilities that they think they could be? Yep, so, um, so, all right, so there's something important about the way the dust behaves in these disks. So the difference between dust and gas is basically, well, I'm breathing, um, is, whereas a dust grain, this is like a dust grain, lands on the floor. So the dust just collects under your bed, whereas the gas supports itself because of pressure. So that's why the dust settles to the midplane of these disks, is because there's not enough dust grains to feel the pressure from each other, and they just sort of sink to the middle. So it's the same business in the radial direction, is basically because the dust orbits a bit faster than the gas, it feels a headwind, and feeling a headwind means the dust starts to drift towards the star. It loses its orbital velocity and starts to head in. And so basically, anything that makes dust pile up so the thing that makes the dust drift in is the gradient of pressure towards the star. So anything that makes dust pile up could make a ring. So planets make a disturbance, and that makes the dust pile up against where the disturbance is. So that works. But there's other thing, any other disturbance could also make dust rings. So one of the ideas, for example, and this is one of the ideas that's been ruled out because it's easy to test, is that there's certain places where the temperature drops. So the temperature drops below 100 degrees, oh sorry, below zero degrees, and your water turns to ice. So say your dust grains have ice on them, some of the ice evaporates, it becomes water, and as you cross this boundary, you know, they become icy or not icy, and that's going to make a ring. But it's very easy to check, you know, it's called, is the temperature there zero degrees, yes or no? And you can measure that, and the answer is no. Um, so that was one of the ideas. All the other ideas are basically theoretical, so something like magnetic fields. The craziest one I heard was what if there's two um, disks, one's rotating this way and one's rotating the other way, and so they cancel you know, each other in this kind of thin strip and make a dark gap. Um, that one's pretty easy to rule out and can measure the way they rotate. Uh, 
Two more? No, I just want to know what they were because it, so so, it seems so obvious. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of other things. Um, so there's some instabilities that have been speculated about. Um, yeah, there's, some of them are hard to rule out, some of them are easy to rule out. So the ones that have been easy to rule out have been ruled out. But we actually did a survey. So we ran a conference in Queensland a couple of months ago with all sort of people working in this field. And we ran a survey of what do you think uh, are causing the gaps in discs. So we were pretty happy with the answer actually because we've been playing this game of you know um, seeing with well finding the evidence for the bodies directly, and that seems to have convinced people that actually a lot of these other things um, aren't the explanation. So the survey results said basically seventy percent said planets, and um, twenty percent said don't know, and ten percent said something else. So that's 90% say don't know all planets. Um, you know, 10%, only 10% were really arguing for something else. So it's, it's actually moved very quickly from like really wild speculation to actually pretty good consensus on what's responsible here. Okay, uh, ask uh, Ian to uh, give thanks to uh, yes. sent me a little note saying it was a good drop. Mm -hmm. right, so let's hope he says the same about this <laughs> this this mine. It's um it's uh it's not a prestigious brand but it's it's good wine. Right, so uh, he has my word for it. Right, we're all entertained tonight by what we did see and uh, I've, I've certainly learned a lot tonight. And uh, for all I just say I started learning astronomy in the late six in the late uh, 60s when I started teaching and uh, and I joined the astronomical ASB and then for the next 20 years um, there was there was articles in the magazines and things about looking for planets but there was no real progress made you know for 20 years or something it wasn't until the 1990s was it, that it started to started to dig dig dirt and we got when we started and now it's gone on Will it ever stop, or will it just go on forever? Well, so one thing I didn't mention is, you know, we're, I think people got bored of individual planets, now they're yeah. looking for these really beautiful systems of things. Yeah. So I think we're, we're now to win the thousands. I think yeah. everyone's but you've got to keep people interested in yeah. that, and, and they're much more interested in perhaps a, a man landing somewhere. Oh, you can't nice make a la man landing on, on Jupiter or Saturn, can you? Right? Or so so uh, these are the problems, aren't they? And so you'd have to find a, an Earth like planet somewhere that we can land on. We can land on, yeah. yeah. And get there, yeah. Anyway, here's his um, we'll uh, break for a tea break now and then uh, come back in here at uh, 10 to 10. Okay, well let's, uh, let's make a start. And uh, give, given the, uh, the time and the fact that uh, some of you are still having uh, cups of coffee, we'll start uh, anyway. Um, uh, we'll skip over Peter Lowe's because he's not here uh, tonight and we'll also give uh, Ian a bit of a rest uh, until next month with the uh, trivia questions. Uh, but we'll start first of all with um, Sky Murphy, a, uh, a well-known uh, member from a while ago who's uh, come back to us <laughs> and uh, she's going to uh, first of all uh, show us a bit uh, with her uh, binoculars here and if you have any questions ask away. And then followed by Sky, we'll uh, move on to Mark here, um, who's uh, grappling with the technology for, uh, for doing uh, Sky for the month. I'll um, hand you over to Sky and uh, give you the headset. Oh, do I need it? <laughs> oh no, I'm embarrassed. Hi. All right, I have to call you. I have to call you. <laughs> Can you hear me? Okay, thank you. Now, I'll try to keep it short, please keep me to time. Um, 
as you know, astronomy always mucks you up. Astronomy has made me do all sort of crazy things for many, many years in my life. And uh, one of the craziest things is also tonight. I don't know why I'm here standing in uh, this room, talking to a room full of experts in binoculars and optics. And some of you are also experts in bird watching. But anyway, I'm hoping that we'll get more and more into observing nature, not just the universe out there, but the plovers, eggs, and uh, some birds. Um, in a short time that I've been playing around with this, I've been using my modest little tiny tennis, uh, binoculars, just the one that I've been using for astronomy, and then the bird watchers classify them as giant telescope and they tell me that you're using uh, giant binoculars they tell me that you are using wrong stuff these are not suitable for bird watching and they said that you must go and buy something smaller these ones are giant <laughs> now these are small for us right so i as usual don't do things the normal way that other people do so I go around this with my invention and uh, I was looking for something in particular and walked into an op shop and found something that uh, was so miserable that they gave it to me <laughs> and I got this thing. It turned out to be a mop bucket. <laughs> so I put a bag around it in here and because I can't afford expensive wine like what has been presented to the speakers. I drink some of this stuff. So this is really suitable for here. So what's, what's going on here? So when other people use their proper uh, binoculars hanging around their neck, they can only carry small ones because they are hanging around their neck and they walk around for like four hours or something like that. I walk with them and everyone criticizes me. And uh, when we get to a place, what I do is just take this off and then I put this here. What's this? It's just, you know, from another project. This is for putting telescope tube on and just the garden thing and a prop over here. This is school show and tell, not associate professor stuff. <laughs> then I'll sit down here and then people would be just watching everything, um, um, looking at things with their proper binoculars. Uh, normally I have these also already open. And then I'll just be sitting here and then I'll be looking uh, at everything and really comfortable. Then people say, aren't they heavy? No, not at all. Because just like everything, like a big sky dancer over there, I came here with some six footers who were trying to help me maneuver that. And then they said, sky so heavy, but I would just use those and then just wheel them around everywhere because the trick in that, just like here, is that you don't carry the weight of that or this. You use with that, if you pull up the wheelbarrow uh, handles, the weight is down on the wheel. You are not carrying that. Just balance it and then push. So over here, I don't carry any weight at all. It's just over here. Yeah? This is not too large. So, uh, walking around as well. This is not heavy. This is just two fingers like this. So um, even today I went to the bird highs um, with man just here and um, looked around. And um, <coughs> if you are by yourself or in a place where you can walk to the left of the path. You don't have to collapse that. You just carry it around like this. You can go around the whole day like this. It doesn't matter. Now, there are pluses and minuses with everything. Oh, by the way, everyone knows this, right? Now, some bird watchers don't seem to know this. You just buy these for like, yes, like uh, less than $30. And uh, 
I've got another piece to show. It just comes with this and the um, um, the what do you call that? Anyway, a holder and then there's a plate um, to slip that on. Now. I don't have time to go into this. You don't always have to keep this on. You just rest on it because with binoculars, if you fall in some birds, you can quickly lift it. With the um, um, camera, just a small one because I wasn't aiming to get really beautiful photographs or anything. Usually I just snap photograph to identify the birds afterwards. You don't need to uh, clip that on either because with the sport setting, you know, you don't need it to be that steady. Just rest on this and then just go. What was it? Even <coughs> if you think that that is um, a bit heavy, that is a really beautiful solution to this. I was trying it. You don't need binoculars actually. If you want it light, just use monocular. You have the weight. Now, I didn't want to go out and buy a monocular. I was using a fighter scope because then you can use the object, uh, um, uh, uh, the eyepiece, and then just uh, focus it like that. So it's really light. Um, I'm rushing a little bit here. I want to show you that just like buying, buying uh, telescopes. When, am I off time? Just like buying a telescope, when I interviewed some of these people here, what telescopes would you buy? They ended up, and uh, Anders in particular, gave me a really good answer. You, you have to get to telescopes. <laughs> so binoculars as well. Uh, horses for courses, that's really good. I saw lots of you know, wonderful birds, really total immersion there, you know, beautiful, um, details and everything, why other people are using this time to uh, Pros and cons, um, 70 meters closest, closer, to, closer than that, I couldn't focus. So uh, you need another pair. So I have already bought another pair. Now that is 15 by 70. I bought another pair, eight by 32. <laughs> so it's gonna be tiny, but optics is everything, so that a pair is coming to me. It is ED glass and is face corrected. So it's going to be quite nice. So you can hang that around the neck. But that is perfect. If bird watchers have their preferences and they say, you know, that's not suitable, well, that's fine, you know, don't argue with them. But I'm warning you beforehand whatever telescope or binoculars you have got, which I hope you all do, uh, keep them and use them for bird watching. It's just Perfect. Okay. Yep. Right. Thank you. <laughs> and if anyone has any uh, questions about binoculars uh, for uh, oh, ask, ask someone else. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, um, and, and maybe sideliner on the way out. <laughs> now I'll uh, hand over to Mark for his inaugural uh, sky for the month. Right. Untangle. <laughs> Thank you. That's a spotter school, baby. You're going to boom away? People hear me, or would you like me to use the microphone? Yeah. The ones who can't hear me, you want the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> can't hear me asking questions. Okay. Um, well, welcome to my first guide for the month uh, for September 2019. And while I was in the process of doing this, I realised we're actually halfway through September. So uh, I've also added a little bit of oct uh, October for you. Okay, so Sky of the Month, September 9, 2019 highlights. Uh, Saturn gets conquered by the Moon. Venus returns to the evening sky. Jupiter is close to a fir first quarter Moon. Neptune's in opposition in Aquarius and the full Moon's on the 14th of September. So for the newer members, by uh, Saturn conquered by the Moon basically means the Moon passes in front of Saturn. So it passes, but it's already occurred. So uh, it was one of the situations why I was doing it. It occurred early this month. Uh, Venus has passed its superior conjunction and is heading around uh, the sun now. It's coming up, uh, it will be visible uh, shortly in the uh, evening sky. 
in the west and as the month progresses they'll be moving to October it will actually get higher as it approaches its start back from elongation. Jupiter close to the first quarter moon as most of you uh, know Jupiter's up about here at the moment uh, the moon's right next to it being a, a bit of a pain if you want to actually observe Jupiter. Neptune's in opposition uh, for the newer members that means it's opposite direction from the earth to the sun. So if the sun's that way and earth's here Neptune's out there, so it's uh, passing its opposition and it's in the uh, constellation of Aquarius. And uh, full moon has already occurred and uh, is starting to wax. With October, Mercury is currently uh, at what's known as its superior conjunction. Now, the two inner planets, both Mercury and Venus, have two conjunctions. They don't have an opposition because they're not further out than us. So when they're actually between the Earth and the Sun, that's their inferior conjunction. And when they're on the opposite side of the Sun, that's known as their superior conjunction. So Mercury currently is in superior conjunction and it is coming around and as we move into October, towards the end of October, it'll actually uh, be up in the evening sky with Venus. Uh, Venus is close to Spica, uh, which is the brightest star in Virgo. Uh, you really don't need to star hop to Venus, it's pretty obvious which one it is. Uranus uh, it is in opposition too, so once again, like last year, we've got four gas planets, uh, essentially all in the sky at one time. Uh, and so last year we were able to do a, a, an eight planet uh, viewing night, uh, seeing all eight planets uh, over the course of an evening. Pretty well, probably be able to do it next year when Mars comes back around. Uh, Moon and Jupiter are close together twice. Uh, so once again, if you're trying to view Jupiter, uh, it's obviously getting in the way of the Moon, or the Moon getting in the way of Jupiter. And the Moon, Venus and Mercury are all fairly close together in close proximity. So they'll be in the, the western sky of an evening. Star chart for the, uh, for the month, I actually used the pointer on here. This is uh, September night sky looking south. If, if you want to imagine it as the October one, just imagine it, it tilts a little bit uh, more. You've got uh, quite a few objects in the sky for, for the night to have a look at. You've got the Triffid Nebula and your Lagoon Nebula. Um, up here, they're quite close to Saturn. Uh, in the tail of Scorpio, there's an uh, open cluster M7 and another open cluster, uh, which apparently is called the Cat's Eyes. You'll notice the Vega Centauri is actually down here, so it's getting very close to the horizon. A bit of an idea will be viewed. But uh, as Greg will point out to anyone uh, willing to listen, there's another open cluster almost as good, which is 47 uh, Tuck uh, up in Kana. See, not coming out there, is it? Just Okay, so. Okay, so 47 Tuck, which is where the arrow is at the moment, is also a globular cluster, which is almost as good as a Vega Centauri to look at. Looking north, which is that way, uh, we don't have a good view, actually either south or north because of the trees, but uh, if you stand and you look in that direction, you'll note Saturn is almost overhead, Jupiter is off to, uh, heading into the western uh, hemisphere of the sky, you still have uh, the Lagoon you know, the Nebulas uh, and uh, Trinidad Nebula. One thing to note coming into October is the option to have a look at the Andromeda Galaxy. The problem with being in south and southern areas of Australia is it's fairly low, low down on the horizon. Now I think anyone who's got access to uh, Scorpius uh, or the notice big put a picture of M40 uh, Sorry, uh, M31 uh, onto it the other night and uh, basically indicated that you need to be somewhere with a good view of the northern uh, horizon to, to see it because it does tend to be very low. Okay, so what are the planets up to? As I said, uh, Mercury's in superior conjunction uh, on the force, so I've already been there, and then it follows Venus into the evening sky. 
Venus uh, will start to appear in the evening in the sky, getting higher as the month passes and, and progresses. Uh, it doesn't need any introduction, as I said, it's pretty obvious. Uh, Earth, yes, it's a planet that gets mentioned as well. Uh, we reach the moon or spring equinox on the 23rd this month. So 12 hours a day, 12 hours a night, and then the days start getting even longer. And then we get daylight saving, which gives us even more daylight, apparently. Uh, Mars is currently in conjunction with the Sun, so it, it's effectively a superior conjunction. It's way over the other side of the Sun. So uh, forget it. It's very humble and struggle with that. Uh, Jupiter is in Ophiuchus, uh, up between Sagittarius and Scorpio. It's in the western sky, getting a little bit lower, so for those dodgy dudes, you don't have to bend down as far to have a look at it. Saturn, still high in the sky in Sagittarius, uh, still as I said there, knee buster uh, for those with dodgy dudes, uh, trying to get down low enough to look at it. Uh, is a cult, or was a cult, by a hideous moon on the 8th and the 9th. So um, we won't be able to see that, but we weren't going to be able to see it anyway. Uh, apparently it had to be north of Rockhampton and his greatest phase in Uh Uranus is approaching opposition, being found in Aries, <coughs> and Neptune can be found in Aquarius. Uh, it also reaches opposition on the 10th, which won't make much difference because it's still a blue dot no matter what you look at it with. Appearance of the planets, not really sure what they look at these two, but uh, generally, as you can see from Venus there, it won't be uh, showing a crescent yet because most of its face will be uh, facing towards us. Uh, Mercury is uh, probably later in the month. Mars, they put it there, but you're not really going to be able to see it because it's in conjunction. Saturn at the moment is ideally tilted with its rings uh, facing towards us, so uh, you can actually get a very good view of the ring and maybe even some of the shadow. Jupiter is always pretty good. Uh, Uranus and Neptune, uh, a blue dot and a slightly bigger blue-green dot. All right, depending on what you're using. And Pluto is in Sagittarius, so if it's a telescope on Sagittarius, and if you can pick which little white dot it is, good luck. So it's a bit of one for the astrophotographers, I think. Uh, you know, take a few shots over a night, stack them, and the street will be Pluto. <laughs> <coughs> okay, uh, Okay. so as I said there, uh, good luck picking it out in Sagittarius because Sagittarius is galactic centre, so there's plenty of stars and other stuff up there to, to uh, take away from it. Uh, comets, hand stars, uh, still available, uh, or still viewable in Taurus, rising after midnight and brightening, and uh, apparently best viewed just before dawn for the real <coughs> media. What magnitude are they? Sorry? Do you know what magnitude? Uh, Pan stars, I think they said is 12 moving to 11. It's actually getting brighter. And McNaught, I think they said it's about 12 okay. uh, at the moment. So McNaught's visible late evening in the constellation of Aries. Uh, I think once again, uh, Ben put a picture on East Scorpius of uh, one of the two of them uh, the other day. I think it was McNaught uh, from memory. <coughs> so the diary for the month. Uh, I've highlighted a few things, but then when I looked at it, I thought there's probably a few other things I could have uh, highlighted. So, uh, <coughs> might as well skip past these ones here because we're past them. So, Tuesday the 18th, it says Saturn stationary. Uh, what it basically means is that because of the, the way the Earth and the planets orbit each other, is every so often the, planets, the, the outer planets will go into a retrograde motion. Uh, so Saturn apparently stops its retrograde motion and it returns to its normal apparent motion. Uh, what that means to anyone is not really a big deal. But, uh, okay. Sunday the 23rd is the equinox. Uh, Saturday the 29th is a new moon. And on the 30th, uh, McNaught is about uh, 0.2 degrees east of uh, star one sig Percy. Which is all very good if you can find that star. Okay. Right, oh, no. all the information provided tonight was provided from Astronomy 2019 by Wallace Falls and Northfield. And I think we've have we got 2021. No, we haven't. We've got them coming in, so if you want to know what's happening next year. 
uh, very handy to have them. The other one was the 2019 Guys of the Night Sky, which is a little A5 book for kids balking, uh, which actually gave us the right pictures. Any questions? No, you one there. Okay, thank you, Matt. There you go. Right. Well, basically it consists of silicate minerals, very much the same things we see on rocks on the Earth's surface. But the way the silicate minerals appear are quite different to anything we see them terrestrially. Little rounded blobs of silicate with rather interesting textures to them, things you can only see in the microscope. I wouldn't be surprised if bacteria could not exist on the carbonaceous compounds in these meteorites. Professor Lovering from Melbourne University's Geology Department has divided the last eight months or so between studying samples of moon rock that he brought back from the United States and the Murchison meteorite. The microelementary analysis service at the university have helped the professor prove many of the speculations he made about the value of the meteorite when he first saw it on this day tonight, last September. With geologists from America, France and Japan clamouring for a chance to submit this meteorite to batteries of tests, just how rare is it? Well, they are very rare. Of all the meteorites that are known, they constitute less than 1%. So it's a very small proportion that makes it a very rare type of meteorite. They are of extreme importance to us people who are interested in the evolution of the Earth and the solar system, because it would seem likely that these materials, these particular types of carbonaceous chondrites, are the most primitive um, materials we have from which the solar system has evolved. They are the fundamental building blocks of the Earth and of the solar system as a whole. Well, does it upset you that this meteorite is in fact being used for you know, as a souvenir rather than um, for its scientific value? Well, it certainly worries me because these uh, meteorites, as I said, they are rare and they're important. And the work that we do on them today won't be the final answer. There's a lot more work to be done in the future as techniques improve and new, and new things arise. And the worry is that we will just run out of this material. It doesn't come all that often. And it is just not right, I think, to squander the material that we have. But this meteorite has another value. Several families in the Murchison district have made quite a business out of collecting and selling it, either by searching through neighboring paddocks where it fell or by buying it from unsuspecting locals and selling it to rock shops and geologists. Although the meteorite will soon crumble into dust if left exposed, Murchison has suddenly become a town of amateur rock hunters. An estimated 250 pounds of the meteorite have been collected. Manna from heaven for those who are keen enough to look for it, but not for those who are lazy, as Mrs Gillick, wife of the local postmaster, found out. It's had, um, how do you put it, had a great effect on our family. We really saw them in the summertime, our troopers were looking for moon rock, a so called moon rock. And uh, they had me walking for miles upon miles and driving them out and bringing them in and uh, packing their lunches and giving them cold drinks day in and day out. And it's just been very hectic and all very exciting. How much meteorite did you find? Well, I would say about, oh, 60 pounds, 66 pounds. And what have you done with it? Well, <laughs> we have exchanged a lot for different stones and minerals and meteorites. We have uh, donated a lot to the Melbourne University and Sydney Museum. And we have also sold a lot to American institutions. How much have you received from selling it? Well, I really wouldn't like to say. We have got quite a bit and uh, it's mostly the boys and it's going to educate the children. There's a reluctance in the district to talk about how much they've found and how much they've sold it for. Um, why the secrecy? Well, I really couldn't answer that, but um, 
I think taxation has got enough to do with it. Everyone fears the tax man. <laughs> Murchison may well have found an answer to the economic plight of Australia's farmers, but it seems that not only the cost of living, but the cost of learning is skyrocketing. Excuse me. Uh, I wondered if you had any of the Murchison meteorite for sale. Yes, we do. Well, have a look at it, please. Well, how much is it? Up to $10 an ounce. And at $10 an ounce, it's exactly a third of the official price of gold. So, I'll hand around my miserable little sample. <laughs> well, basically, it's just a meteorite for you to have a look at, and also the, uh, the current stamp surface. issue. But the way the silicate minerals appear is quite different to anything we see in terrestrially. Little rounded blobs of silicate with rather interesting textures to them, things you can only see in the mic. This particular fragment is one of the pieces of the Murchison meteorite that fell in Victoria in 1969. And it's the most exciting meteorite because it has very primitive chemistry. It existed, we believe, before the sun turned on as a star and indeed before the solar system really aggregated into the planets we see now. Murchison meteorite fell over Victoria at near the town of Murchison in northern Victoria. And the exciting thing about it was that it, because it fell at daytime and close to where people were living, uh, and it made such a racket when it fell because it was, uh, they, when they come through the atmosphere, not only do you see them, the great fiery trail, but when they get close to the ground, they explode and you hear this great roar of the explosion. It sounds like an unexpressed train. So people knew something had happened and they all went out and started to collect it straight away, which was really great because it wasn't contaminated by sitting on the earth for any length of time. When I first saw the meteor, I, I had found it was in a plastic bag. And when it was opened up, suddenly this great organic chemistry smell hit me, just like methylated spirits, very, very strong. And I looked in and there was this black, looked like a lump of coal, and I knew exactly what it was straight off. It was a carbonaceous chondrite, one of the most primitive of all the meteorites. And there it was in its very, very pristine condition. It was very exciting. Well, I was professor of geology at Melbourne, uh, university at the time and uh, we got some of the samples and immediately we analysed it to make absolutely sure that it was indeed a carbonaceous chondrite. Later on people started to do work on the organic composition of the meteorite which there's about what two percent organic material in the meteorite and about ten percent water. It's a lot of funny things that, you know you don't find normally in, in meteorites and uh, the exciting thing there has been the complexity of the organic compounds they've found. Many amino acids, hundreds of amino acids, the building blocks of life itself are all present in this, in, in this meteorite. When the meteorite entered the Earth's atmosphere, it, uh, it broke up and fragments were moving through the atmosphere and they were still high enough up to ablate, or as we say, melt on the surface themselves. So each little fragment, in this case, is totally surrounded by molten material, which sealed in the organic compounds. Life is a, a, a function of the complexities of a number of organic compounds, including amino acids, complex amino acids. We wouldn't be alive without those. And the interesting thing, of course, is organic compounds in the meteorite formed in outer space contain similar sorts of these complex amino acids. Now, how one joins the amino acids that are condensing in space as part of the whole condensation processes in the solar nebula, with life on Earth is what the big unanswered question. One more uh, about meteorites. This is from uh, the Field Museum. Philip Heck, I'm the Robert A. Pritzker Associate Curator for Meteorites and Polar Studies here at the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago. I'm uh, the curator in charge of the meteorite collection 
here at the Field Museum, I make sure that the scientific community has access to those meteorites by sample requests. But I'm also studying them myself. So I'm having my own meteorite research program and I'm also teaching at the University of Chicago. And this center exists thanks to a major grant from the Chicago-based Tabani Foundation. This enables us to do meteoritics research and polar studies research in perpetuity. Now, the Murchison meteorite is one of our treasures at the Field Museum here, one of the treasured meteorites of the scientific community. The oldest meteorites are thought to be the carbonaceous chondrites like Murchison. They formed in the very earliest days of the solar system, or basically the components of them formed very early on, and they define actually the start of the solar system. They come from different uh, asteroids, from carbon-rich asteroids, and they're mainly thought to be from the outer asteroid belt. But these, all these meteorites have one thing in common. They were ejected from their parent body in a collision. The interesting thing, they haven't changed much since then, so they can actually, by studying this meteorite, we can learn something about the very early solar system. The physical conditions, the chemistry, all that defines what we, are, what we have today. So that's why the early solar system is so important to us. Part of this meteorite is real stardust. This, this means these are minerals that formed in the outflows and ejecta of stars that don't exist anymore. But it's a multitude of stars of different types that form these uh, materials. The stars are essentially the element factories that uh, produce the elements that our world, our everyday world, is made of. So the carbon, for example, is made in solar-like uh, stars at the end of their life. Uh, the heavier elements, the metals, are made in more massive stars. And uh, we actually can find the meteorites like Murchison, we can find uh, individual grains of pre-solar stardust. It floated through our galaxy for millions and for billions of years and became part of the solar nebula from which the planets and the planetesimals and asteroids form. Murchison is the most prolific source of pre-solar grains. Scientists already suspected that there would be pre-solar grains in meteorites. If you take a chunk of this meteorite off, analyze it in a mass spectrometer, you can analyze the major components and so on, find it's a solar system object, but you can also measure trace gases, trace elements, and see that the composition of those trace elements is very different, the isotopic composition. So the variety of these trace elements can be such that no solar system process can explain their presence. There was a decades-long search in Chicago at the University of Chicago with carbonaceous chondrites, Murchison, and others uh, to find the carrier of this exotic component. And finally, in 1987, uh, the carrier of the exotic xenon component was discovered. We can do astronomy, astrophysics, with a sample in our laboratory, with a real sample of a star. Actually, this is a sample of a multitude of stars. Several dozens or hundreds of parent stars are in this little vial. Some of those minerals are two billion years older than the sun that makes them six and a half billion years old. And they're still here as have they have formed. They haven't changed. We're coming up on the 50th anniversary of the Murchison meteorite fall. The bulk of our knowledge of the early solar system comes from the study of Murchison and a few other uh, carbonaceous compounds. The Field Museum holds the largest uh, fraction of Murchison in, in its collection and it's made available for, some, for the scientific community and it provided a really great resource for uh, studying uh, the early solar system. The Murchison meteorite fell on September 28, 1969 in Australia, near a town called Murchison, north of Melbourne. It's in a habited area, so people were hunting for the meteorite and picked it up shortly after it fell. The fall happened after the Apollo 11 lunar landings, 50 years ago, so the world's top labs were already equipped uh, with the analytical equipment to study lunar rocks that were brought back by the astronauts. So they were ready for extraterrestrial rocks. Murchison came at the perfect time and they could go into these top labs and be analyzed. We are very grateful that the community of Murchison made these rocks available to science. Even 50 years later, after the fall, the Murchison meteorite is an extremely valuable resource for science. Many PhD students have current theses on Murchison. I made my thesis myself on Murchison, 
uh, it still has many secrets that it keeps. It's a true treasure trove for science. So it's a, uh, a very impressive looking meteorite, very black and uh, very smooth. So uh, unlike uh, a lot of others that you do see. Last thing for this evening is uh, I thought I would um, fill you in on the competition that we ran during National Science Week this year, during uh, July and uh, August. And uh, effectively, we were offering a moon rock for uh, any school children uh, around Australia who wish to estimate the number of craters there are on the moon. And that's all the information we gave them um, estimate the number of craters. Now, the winner of the competition was going to be using, uh, it was going to be determined using the method known as wisdom of the crowd, and it's a mathematical method that effectively just means take the average um, uh, from a whole heap of guesses. And there was a wonderful ABC documentary by the mathematician Lily Cerner um, uh, about uh, a year ago, where she uh, used exactly the same technique to work out the weight of Ayers Rock, or Uluru. And uh, this is exactly the same method uh, as was used there. She got it within about 15%, which was amazing uh, at the time. Um, in her particular case, there was 100 people she asked to guess how much uh, Uluru weighed. In our particular case, uh, we ended up with 472 entries coming in from school kids around the country. Uh, after we got rid of the ones who were a little bit old, like 68 year old school kids and uh, things like that, um, uh, and we deduplicated some because some kids were so enthusiastic they put in two entries or three entries. Uh, we got down to 431 unique ones that uh, fell within the school age range and we couldn't uh, really tell whether they were or not, so, so very much a, uh, uh, an, honest, uh, an honesty system. Now you see from the graph here as a uh, date goes from left to right how the number of entries coming in uh, went up with time. So as it got closer and closer, obviously things started to get out on social media and uh, more and more kids uh, started entering. Now, about half of them came from Victoria. And uh, as you see, the next uh, most popular entries were from uh, Western Australia, which uh, was, uh, was quite interesting. Uh, whereas right down the very bottom, you have uh, nothing came in from the Northern Territory and uh, our, our nation's capital uh, barely uh, barely entered anything. So um, there were entries from, as I say, right around uh, the country. Now, sometimes we would get teachers actually asking us um, for uh, more information. So, for example, I would tell them that the moon has two hemispheres uh, for your estimates, so it's not just the side that you see. Um, also, bear in mind that the uh, moon doesn't have an atmosphere. Uh, to speak of. So in other words, uh, you're not going to get shooting stars uh, in, in the sky. Uh, everything that comes in from space is going to hit the surface of the moon, full stop, right? It's not going to uh, disintegrate to very fine dust. It's going to come straight in at full force, which in incidentally is one of the things that was a bit of a concern for NASA with the astronauts, that you have all these bullets coming in from, uh, from space with nothing to uh, protect the astronauts on the surface. Now, the other thing was, what's, what's a crater? How big does a hole have to be to actually be a crater? And uh, pretty much like the definition of planets, um, there was no definition of a crater. Uh, NASA themselves actually were referring to craters down to 10 centimetres, one centimetre in size and even less. So effectively, it's like any hole really that uh, can be made. Um, so we've assumed in uh, the calculations that we did that uh, it's one millimetre, which is about the size of um, a crater that was made in one of the space shuttle uh, windshields by a uh, fleck of paint as it was coming back in. Uh, so we thought, well, okay, well, if we're going to set, set a limit, uh, that's, uh, that's about it. Now, some students got lazy and did a Google search and that didn't really help them very much because the answer really isn't on Google unless you have some very good research skills for uh, the high school or primary school age. Uh, if you use Google, what tended to happen was uh, you would get the very big craters of 20 kilometres or more. And even then, there's getting on for 180,000 of those, so there's an awful lot of, um, of those. 
the smallest guess that we had come in from any child was 15 craters on the moon, which um, is probably not, uh, not bad, considering that some of these kids were age four or five that uh, were, uh, were having a go. Uh, the biggest uh, one we had was um, uh, one followed by 21 zeros, or uh, 1,000 quintillion craters, which um, is uh, very, very large. <clears throat> now, uh, we do a bit of a sanity check on this. Um, we know the surface area of the moon, and if we assume that we peppered the moon entirely with one millimetre holes, you can actually go through the, uh, the mathematics of it, and you come up with about 38 quintillion little holes on the, on the surface of uh, the moon. Now, of course, uh, that's not a very realistic uh, one because craters overlap per craters. Um, but uh, it gives you a ballpark estimate of uh, the size that we're, we're talking. So 38 followed by 18 zeros. Now we can improve on that uh, using the fact that uh, NASA's uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory sent uh, a fleet of spacecraft known as the Ranger spacecraft to the moon in the mid 1960s. Some of them missed the moon and went barreling off into space. Uh, some of them crashed into the moon and had um, uh, camera malfunctions, but three of them actually uh, made it and uh, brought back high resolution images. Yes, Philip? Did the Ranger impacts count as craters? <laughs> <laughs> Plus one. <laughs> Good point. Um, so Ranger 7, 8 and 9 actually made it to photograph uh, the moon and uh, at the time the resolution from the photographs that they were sending back was 25 centimetres. Uh, bear in mind also that uh, th this is before the level of detectors that we have today, but even a pixel at uh, 25 centimetres across is pretty high resolution, especially when you're talking about cameras uh, in the 1960s. And that's a picture of uh, uh, one of the Ranger craft uh, over there. Now, um, Applying a bit of uh, burrowing skills, uh, I was actually able to find a uh, paper that was uh, published in an astronomical journal in 1966 where NASA actually published these little graphs. And what they did from the range of photographs is they manually counted all the craters of different sizes. Now, that would have been a huge, huge task to be done, but undoubtedly they probably gave it to some women to do, or students to do, or that sort of thing, particularly in that uh, era. And um, they actually provide a lot of very good information. So the three Ranger craft there um, produce these three diagrams here. These are log log plots. So along the bottom is the diameter of the crater, and it goes from uh, about hundreds of kilometres in diameter right down to um, getting on for uh, 10 centimetres across. So they're talking about really small craters. And this is the cumulative population. So in other words, it's the population of everything of that size or bigger. And as you see in these three separate areas of the moon that they looked at, including the Sea of Tranquility, wonderful straight line relationship. And the paper actually then speculated that although they um, physically measured the photographs down to the equivalent of about a metre, uh, a metre sized crater, that they had no problems at all with extrapolating that a little further. So what, um, what I did was I extrapolated it a little further down to one millimetre craters instead of um, the, uh, the one metre or 10 centimetres shown here. And with that, you get about um, one quintillion craters of that size based on uh, photographs. So the estimate we had by assuming that it was just peppered with one millimetre hole was 38 quintillion. NASA's photographs give you one quintillion, so one followed by 18 zeros. And now the answer from the wisdom of the crowd of Australia's kids is 2.3 quintillion craters. So not bad going for a bunch of four to 18 year olds to get 2.3 quintillion compared to NASA's one quintillion. Very, very close uh, indeed. Now, the winner of the competition uh, had actually guessed two quintillion, so two followed by 18 zeros, but they haven't responded to our approach for them to um, get back to us. So we gave them a week to actually contact a teacher to verify that they really existed and weren't a 
68 year old uh, pretending to be a 14 year old so okay they didn't get back to us so we went to the second one who guessed 1.2 quintillion is the next closest they also as of tonight haven't got back to us in that time so we're going to try one more time um, to, uh, to to someone else uh, on the list who guessed 0.2 quintillion and if for some reason they don't reply then we might have a, a lunar meteorite sitting in our little cabinet over there in the, in the near future. Uh, but uh, you never know. It may very well be that the kids don't check their emails that often. Um, some of them are actually school emails, email addresses, so we know that they've come um, from, uh, from a school environment. Um, others are Gmail ones, so you just don't really know who uh, actually sent those. So we're still waiting for that. There's a picture of um, the one that we have. It's about the size of a fingernail um, of uh, uh, Luna Breccia. So in other words, that's been smashed out of the moon in a crater impact. And some of that material has actually found its way to Earth. And if you look on very special places on the Earth's surface, such as in the uh, sands of the Sahara Desert, where it's sand in all direction, or in the, uh, the snow and ice fields of Antarctica, where it's just snow and ice in all directions. If you find a pile of rocks sitting there and there are none others around, you know that they didn't come there naturally. They've come from, uh, from uh, space. So this particular sample uh, is uh, one from Northwest Africa. So it landed around the Morocco uh, area and is part of a fall where what they do is they pick up all the rocks uh, in the area that, uh, that match the type they chemically analyse the biggest one usually, and all the others are assumed to be from the same fall, which is a reasonable assumption. So this is one of the ones that is, uh, has been twinned, or in other words, has, hasn't been directly analysed itself, but the assumption is its parent one that was analysed as uh, matching the moon's uh, composition uh, is uh, exactly the same as it. So this time next month, we may know if we have a winner, or we may know if, um, if we have a, a, a lunar meteorite instead for our collection. All right, well, with that, I think um, we'll close. Uh, unless anyone has anything else uh, to say, given that it's uh, gone 10.30. And we'll see you all back here uh, next, uh, next month. And maybe some of you will come to the Saturday working bee and barbecue and maybe viewing in the evening as well. And thank you, everybody.